So there are uh, currently nine next generation ALK inhibitors that are in uh, clinical development, meaning they're either in a clinical trial or they're just about to enter a clinical trial. Um, and some of these are quite advanced, like LDK378 and Electinib, and others are just entering studies. Um, all of these really have been uh, developed to be uh, more potent than Zalcori. Um, they're structurally different um, than Zalcori. Many of them are known to overcome some of the resistance mutations that can occur that can cause crizotinib resistance. Um, and uh, as I said, some of them are quite far along. So the one I'll mention and then uh, the others can chime in on the others um, is LDK378, which now goes by a generic name, Seritinib. Um, this drug was first started in clinical trials um, almost exactly three years ago, um, actually this month, and uh, is, it has looked very good in the phase one trial um, as well as in follow-up um, phase two and, and ongoing phase three studies. We'll, we're waiting for results on that. But the response rates um, to these next generation ALK inhibitors like LDK378, even in patients who have already been on crizotinib and relapsed, is very high. It's close to 60%, which as you heard, is what the response rate is to, some, to crizotinib when, you've seen, when you're seeing crizotinib for the first time. So basically these drugs, for many crizotinib resistant patients, these drugs are able to reinduce yet another very dramatic response. So we've been very excited to see that. Um, we saw that early on with LDK, and that's kind of what spurred the development of LDK378. Um, <clears throat> and currently, in terms of the status of LDK, um, the filing to the FDA has been submitted, and um, this is based on the phase one data, which, as I mentioned, shows a 60% response rate. The average, what we call the progression-free survival, is in the seven to eight month range. So again, not that different from what we see uh, with crizotinib. And, there is hope that this drug will become commercially available in, in two to three months. Do you want to address Ariad? Or? Yeah, I can do that. So, um, so, there are, so why do you need all of these drugs? And none of them are perfect is the short answer. So crizotinib, I, I remember Alice and I were in the same advisory board, so sometimes drug companies bring us in and pick our brains. And, you know, uh, one of them saying, well, you know, what are crizotinib's Achilles heels? And, and it's a great drug. I mean, in the vast majority of people tolerate it well. Um, you know, it works amazingly well. But as we got more used to it, we could see that it wasn't perfect. You know, the brain was an Achilles heel. Some people don't tolerate it. You have to take it twice a day. It was so quickly licensed that not every side effect had actually been described by the time it was out there. So then subsequently discovered it dropped men's testosterone. We recently published that it has an effect on measures of kidney function. And that's all of those things are going to apply to the, you know, whatever of the next nine drugs. None of them will be perfect. Um, so we have to find the one that's going to be best tolerated. And it may be best tolerated for you, but not for you, you know, just like anything else. Brain penetration is, all of them are kind of, showing some activity, but it comes back to the quality of the clinical <coughs> trials. You really want hard data that say, don't just show me an MRI scan that something's getting better. What proportion of people are shrinking in the brain? How long does that shrinkage last? And that will need to come out. Um, but the, the Ariad drug um, is also looking very good, the Electinib drug. So, but LDK is the one that you're going to get the biggest splash about because it's going to be the first to be licensed later this year, we think. So I think showing up on the screens is the what we call a waterfall plot, where the downward lines means tumor shrinkage. And the more that are going down, as in you know, this is a plot that shows that just about the vast majority of patients on this have some tumor shrinkage. Uh, many have a quite a, a lot. And the, the lines in blue represent people who had been on Zalcori before. And the people on uh, in yellow, or the bars in yellow, represent people who have not gotten it, and they, there seems to be no difference between them. And that's a, a striking feature of these second generation ALK inhibitors is they all show comparable activity whether you got uh, Zalcori first or not. So in terms? That's with, with that's with LDK. Yeah. In terms of response, response in rate, in terms of, of duration of response, though, when can, we don't have sort of final data yet on how long, long those, last, right. the thought might be that if you were to start with a more potent ALK inhibitor, perhaps the duration of response could be longer than if you started with one, one like crizotinib, but we don't know that yet. Okay, and, and then, so let's get to the question, and Ross, you raised this in the past, first talking about second generation ALK inhibitors when they were very, very early in a few dozen patients, is 
if we had these drugs available, would we definitely want to, would you want to save it for second line with the thought that, well, we have something that works early and doesn't probably work late, and we have something that works just as well early and late, or would you want to do what, what Alice just suggested, is lead with your, your best treatment? So one of the, the issues is if you have you know, your existing drug and then your new drug and you compare them head to head and the, the new drug is a few months better, that's not actually the information you want. Because if you do the old drug followed by the new drug, that total may be much longer than what you do if you play your joker first. The alternative side of the argument is if you use your better drug first, maybe because you're preventing these mechanisms of resistance from occurring in the first place, the total duration will be much longer. And we just don't know. Those trials have to be done. Um, I mean, the worry, of course, is that we, we do worry that if you expose someone to a really most potent ALK inhibitor first, um, while one thought might be that you could delay or hopefully even prevent the emergence of resistance, another thought is that you could actually select out really resistant disease earlier. So I think we just have to wait for the studies to, to tell us um, what's going to be better. We'll be having those kind of studies at some point. Yeah, well, and, and the other thing, obviously, is if there's a difference in the side effect profile, you know, having the best first only works if the best is tolerable. Sometimes the traditional model in oncology is you, you, know, you save the nasty, horrible, toxic stuff for later, you know, if you possibly can. So uh, these drugs all have some degree of activity in the brain, which is different. From, we've seen good responses. We haven't completely characterized how much and how long, but uh, they all seem to have more activity than crizotinib does for, for brain. So that would be a reason in itself to potentially make a switch if somebody's prone to multiple brain metastases mm -hmm. in a, as their primary or only area of progression over time. I guess you could consider ongoing radiation, but uh, how about side effect profile? You brought that up. Are there differences? Uh, what are we seeing from the tolerability of the, the ones that are at least the furthest along? Why, why don't we ask the guys in the audience who've been on both? Yeah, so for people who have been on uh, Crizotinib and Zalcori and something else, any comments, any thoughts on how you've tolerated one versus another? I have a Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I was on Zalcori for 18 months, tolerated pretty good, and then had this terrible flare-up that I've already mentioned. And now I went on Ariad, and I'm on that now um, seven months. I'm starting to have issues with it now. It was great the first uh, seven months, and now I'm having issues with pain. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, my last CAT scan was pretty clear. Um, the, my bone lesions were stable. Uh, tumors on my liver uh, practically disappeared. So on one hand, it appears to be working. On the other hand, you know, this, the pain is not... Uh, where, where do you have the pain? Over. What? Where do you have the pain? Uh, in the back, lower back. Okay. Sometimes you can get a kind of almost like achy muscles, people have described, or kind of pinpoints. Yeah, I, and, and that's, yeah, that's, you know, that's an area I'm not sure of, I, you know, I, and I understand that you're not, you know, that it's a difficult area to... You know, how do I make a decision on that? That's the question. Well, you, if you figure out, to, to put it bluntly, to figure out if it's the drug, you have to stop the drug and see if the symptoms get better. But you don't want to stop it. You don't want to stop it so long you get the flare. So you're right. catch-22. So the doctor said clinically, he's doing great. They see no discernible signs of cancer in his liver anymore yeah. or anywhere else. The bones are stable, but he is having this very bad pain. So can we it just make the pain tolerable in some other way? Um, That's yeah. what we're thinking. Yeah, I mean, two weeks ago, I wasn't taking anything for pain, and now I'm taking a lot of stuff for pain. Mm -hmm. How about other people? Are there others? Do you have some in the back? Yeah. Linnea? Thank you. I think I kind of have the advantage of having the perspective of starting with the um, lobectomy and then traditional chemotherapy. And I did go on Tarceva briefly um, before they knew that that wasn't a good idea if you were ALK positive. And I had a difficult time with all of those. So when I went on crizotinib, I couldn't believe how easy it was, you know, just walk in the park. And then I went on LDK and I had a few more issues, um, GI, you know, and I, I had a little bit of liver toxicity. But again, super, super simple. And for me, I think it's just comparing it to chemotherapy because with these targeted therapies, 
I could have a normal life. You know, I could do normal activities. And then last January, I returned to chemotherapy again, um, Olympta and carboplatin, and it, it was tough again, you know, and I'm, I'm looking very much forward to once again doing a targeted therapy. Just, I, I think there's a huge difference. Another? Yeah. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Um, my husband's um, had two lines of chemo, and he's had whole brain radiation. He's had a temporal lobe resection, and he's had gamma um, three times. And um, he continues to have progression in the brain. The Zalcori seems to work for his body and hold him, but um, we obviously have to address the brain issue. Um, so we've moved on to lectinib, and he's only been on that for two months, and um, we'll find out on Monday whether... He's doing well. Um, my observation is that he's just tired, and he gets a little redness in his legs, but he doesn't make any complaints. I think he's Superman, but. <laughs> so, so. Uh, now I know Alice has worked a lot, I think both of you have worked a lot with uh, seritinib LDK, um, and some concern that tolerability could be an issue and that many patients might end up needing to lower the dose and still do quite well. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, so uh, this, the standard dose for seritinib is 750 milligrams a day, and um, you know that's the dose that we established was what we call the maximum tolerated dose. It doesn't mean it's the best and most efficacious dose. It's just the way the trials are designed is to establish what is the safest dose that can be tolerated by patients. In fact, patients can tolerate 750, but most patients do need a dose reduction. Um, I would say at our institution, I, I probably dose reduce three quarters of my patients from 750 milligrams down to 600 or even 450 milligrams a day. And that really makes a huge difference in terms of the side effects. The main side effects with, I would say overall, because I've used um, probably five of the new ALK inhibitors, um, I think seritinib is, has the most side effects, the GI side effects, the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, however, once you are um, sort of optimally managed, and generally once the dose has come down to 600 or 450 milligrams, the side effects are, are much, much easier. And I would say it approaches what it's like to be on, on Zalcori. So I think it requires aggressive symptom management, especially early on. It probably will require a dose reduction for many patients, but then it's, it's quite manageable. Do you have any concerns when you drop the dose about the penetration into the brain? Um, I mean, there's always that concern uh, that in general that you're just dropping the dose and so your exposure level in your body as well in your, as in your brain is lower. Um, I think there will be a study soon looking at the effect of food on LDK and it is known that food or uh, food will increase absorption of LDK and so not that we sh should be advising patients to do this but I think in the future um, for LDK is that um, the dose, there'll be dose studies looking for a, a more optimal dose with food that will allow us to achieve the same level as the 750, but without all the side effects. Okay. And the, some patients can alleviate some of the nausea by taking these drugs with food, Quite including Zalcori. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Is LDK the one they talk about fasting for two hours yes. before you take it? Well, yes, for, for Ariad as well, oh, you fast oh, two hours before. But um, <clears throat> for that's how the label will probably read since the studies were all done that way, um, fasting. But as I said, the, there will be a large food study done. And our hope is that the food will alleviate the side effects and at the same time improve the drug exposure levels. But I think it's an important point to make, you know, when you have Alice's experience, it would be a terrible thing to have people throw away the drug uh, when so few docs really have a lot of experience with, with these right. agents. You can get scared off after a, a bad week or two and think that the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are prohibitive when it's actually something that if the dose gets lowered, and this may be something that the patients need to tell other patients mm -hmm. more than, I mean, we'll, certainly we'll try to reach the doctors too, but I think it can only help to reach lots of people to say, before you discard the drug, think about lowering the dose, it might work out remarkably better for you. Right, because I have a number of patients who are even on at 300 milligrams or 450, so almost half the dose, and they've been doing really well. So oh, definitely don't want to discard it right away. How about heat shock protein inhibitors? Are they, how far along are they as an option? Um, as when you give them on their own, they have shown some activity in people who have never seen one of these you know, tablet-based therapies, although the duration of benefit has been relatively short. They're really being explored now in combination. Um, 
either in combination with crizotinib in some of the studies, and then there's an interesting study in combination with LDK after some of these second generation drugs are, are failing. Um, they're inconvenient, they're given intravenously, often once a week, um, but if that's what keeps you in the game, it'll be worth it. But we have yet to have a real readout in terms of the efficacy yet. Okay, uh, other comments on that? No, I would agree. Single agent HSP90 inhibitors in crizotinib resistance, I think that they're probably of modest benefits and where we might see hopefully better activity is in combinations. How about uh, a s one second generation ALK inhibitor after another or in somebody who was an early progressor on crizotinib? Any sense that you can pull, you know, that, that you can get that much better of a response? Or are you mostly going to be seeing good responses in people who are doing well for nine or 12 months or longer. Well, we have some examples in the audience. So if, if Susan would dare to put her hand up and tell us your story, I mean, she was going into a deep, dark hole, and we pulled her out. Um, well, I was on crizotinib for maybe only six weeks, and it was doing really well. And, um, and then I developed resistance. And um, uh, what was our next step? <laughs> We gave some radiotherapy. We oh, we did radiation, um, chemotherapy. The radiation worked for a while. Um, it worked really well. Um, the chemotherapy did not work at all. And then uh, brain metastasis um, started. And um, I, I was just going to go on the LDK. And, um, and then I had to go on steroids for the brain tumors. So I was kicked off LDK before I even started. Um, had brain surgery. And, um, and then after that, the Ariad was started. And so, um, so what was the question exactly? Uh, <laughs> basically, to, to illustrate that, to do with the brain surgery. that people. <laughs> yeah. You and I can talk well. <laughs> <laughs> we we can have the same conversation the, multiple times. But the, yeah, pro I know. <laughs> the proof of principle that there are people who can benefit greatly from these agents after being pretty early progressors on. Zalcori, any sense? I don't even Zalcori know if there's any. did not work for me really at all. It, I had one great scan. I thought I was going to be the star patient. I failed to be the star patient. Yeah. Um, but Ariad, I've been on it for eight months now, and it has been amazing. I mean, I really have no cancer. Um, I have holes in my brain, but <laughs> which you can all tell. But um, I, I have no cancer. My tumor markers are at 1.3. They've been sitting there for six months like that. Um, it, it's been incredible uh, with minimal side effects. I think also with, with different drugs that you take, um, you can play around, just like with any drug, you can play around when, what time of day you take it, what you eat it with. Um, I moved my Ariad from the morning where I was sick all the time to just taking it before bedtime. It works really well for me um, to just sleep yeah. through it. And now I don't even take um, any anti-nausea with it or anything. It's, it's been wonderful. And, and like you said, um, it's way better than many other options for treatment, you know, such as chemo, radiation. Those were really hard. And um, it's hard to live a normal life with chemo, with radiation, and with these onco inhibitors. It's, it's been incredible um, to be able to, to somewhat live a normal life. So that, that was another point. As you were saying, switching to the evening, I know you said, yeah, yeah that you've done that too. I, I believe you've recommended, I mean, many people who have experienced this have found that it can be helpful to switch to evenings and sleep through any nausea um, and do better with that. Um, any, any information at all, even anecdotally, about people switching from one second gen inhibitor to another? Or would you be far more enthusiastic about switching to a heat shock protein inhibitor or some other, or, or, or some other novel approach, you know. So anecdotally, I definitely have patients who have come uh, off of Zalcori and then gone on to um, Electinib and then come to me for LDK and have responded. This is all anecdotal, of course, yeah. a handful of cases. So I think there is some hope that you can go beyond just, you know, one or two next gen, uh, one or two ALK inhibitors. And I probably would even favor that over an HSP90 inhibitor monotherapy, just given the limited okay. efficacy that we've seen in that setting. 